Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so like I said, I'm uh, Andrew. I'm a fifth year senior. Um, I'm currently working in uh, Dave Cobden's nanophysics lab. Um, right now, my plans for undergrad are uh, to kind of find a job and then we'll go from there and, and potentially look at grad school in a couple of years. Um, in terms of choosing which group to work in, I, I kind of didn't. Um, it was an opportunity that presented itself. And so I, I, I just took it. Um, it seemed like an interesting field. And so I I jumped on it uh, as soon as it became available. Um, and uh, I, I became involved in the in the research group uh, through a TA that I had uh, in, in electromagnetism. Um, my TA, my old TA is uh, in the group and he and I were just kind of talking after class and uh, I was asking him about his research. Um, one thing led to another um, and he invited me to come uh, take a look at the lab uh, and then a spot wound up opening up and uh, that's how I wound up working in that in that research group. And uh, I've been there since uh, January. So um, it's been almost a year. Uh, and since then, um, I've helped with some of the nano materials that uh, Eric, my former TA, uh, works on. Uh, and then I've also kind of started to uh, work on what is now my honors thesis project, which is the breakdown field of uh, hexagonal boron nitrite, which is um, pretty interesting to me. Um, but yeah, that's that's me and my research uh, path. Awesome. That's perfect. Perfect detail. Thanks a lot. Um, hi, I'm Liam. I'm a senior, <laughs> fourth year. Um, since last fall, I've been doing research in the math department in the WXML program. Uh, in a group uh, led by Dr. Feinstein, which is about kind of finding uh, universal limiting behavior of quantum systems. And then uh, this, since this summer, I started doing research with Dr. Andre, uh, Anton Andreev in the physics department on like physical kinetics and finding kinetic coefficients. And it's all kind of theory work because I'm hoping to go to graduate school for theoretical physics. Um, and uh, I got involved in, in WXML by applying. I applied the first time in my sophomore year and I didn't get in, but I applied again my junior year uh, and I managed to get in. But with Anton, I just kind of sent him an email because one of my friends started working with him. And he seemed like a really cool uh, research advisor. Can you say what WXML is? Uh, it's the Washington Experimental Mathematics Lab. It's an undergraduate research program run by the math department. And they have like probably 10 or so projects each quarter. Um, some of them are continuing and you can apply for it every quarter. Uh, have, they have a listing. I don't think it's up yet for this coming quarters, but um, if you just read through those, some of them are really interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Truly. Um, hi, I'm Truly. Um, I'm a senior and I'm currently working uh, with the Helium-6 Press project um, at SEMPA, the Center for Experimental Nuclear uh, Physics and astrophysics. Yeah, One day I'll learn it. <laughs> and so I'm working with Alejandro Garcia. Uh, I started research last spring when I was taking electromagnetism. He was offering lab tours. And I was like, yeah, I'll go to our lab. And I've been looking around for research. And then I just emailed him afterwards and started working with the group. Um, and after undergrad, I'm applying to grad school. So we'll see how that goes. Hi. Hello, my name is Quinn. I am also a senior here and I am currently applying to grad school. Um, I work with Amit and Nora Mohammed and we do sort of what I think of as theoretical biophysics. Last year I did a project on uh, mutations in proteins and this year I'm doing a population genetics project. I got started in this lab well, I guess when I came to UW, I knew that I wanted to do research. So I read the website of every person at the UW, know, math, <laughs> physics, bio, whatever. And I made a ranking and then I started emailing down the ranking. And the first time I emailed or that, she uh, told me I wasn't qualified enough. So I said, okay. And I started working with someone else. And then the next year, I emailed her again and she said, all right, you can my lab. Cool. Great. Thanks. Olivia. Okay. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm also a fourth year senior and I'm planning to go to grad school for physics right after graduation. 
and actually working two labs. So I'll try to speed run that. So I have worked in Chunachu's lab for about 13 months now. That's a condensed matter experiment lab. I basically just work under a particular grad student I just do like a bunch of his projects while work on different parts of it, but it's essentially like growing materials and analyzing them. And then I also work in Professor Kumta's lab as of uh, the summer. And in that lab, I've mostly done like machining and uh, like circuit and soldering. It's pretty fun. And that, uh, his lab in general does like uh, cold atoms, but I don't work particularly much with the atomic part of it. Um, and both of them, I kind of got just by email with the professors. Um, Juno, I just like, I was looking through condensed matter because so I was like, gee whiz, I sure love quantum mechanics. And I read his group's description and I was like, this sounds very fun. I just emailed him and was like, hey, I'd love to join you if I have a new room. Here's my like transcript. And he was like, sure, you have good grades, why not? And he just let me on. And then with Gupta, I also just emailed him and he ended up. Just being like, oh, I remember having a new class. Why not? So. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Jack. I'm an astronomy major as well as physics uh, senior as well. And I am in Sarah Tuttle's lab. And she does a lot of like instrumentation, which kind of differs from a lot of other astronomy physics. It kind of involves a lot more than just uh, astronomy research is more like engineering, math, physics based as well. Um, and so like currently, uh, she's working on a design for a spectrograph to fit onto Apache Point Observatory, which you know, partially owns. Um, and yeah, I got that. I was looking for new research, um, astronomy research, since I, I plan on applying uh, this quarter um, to grad schools. And uh, I was looking for like a more astronomy research background um, from my previous physics lab. And I was in her class uh, and I was just talking with her about my previous research um, based on like, it was based in optics. And she said, oh, hey, like I, I have a project that's very similar to what you're doing right now. Do you wanna uh, come join my lab, start a summer? Um, so I did, and that was like almost six months ago. And it's been fun ever since. Awesome. Um, I'm Vikram. Uh, this is actually, so this is my fourth year and actually my, my last quarter as a student at the UW. Uh, I'll be graduating with majors in physics and astronomy and minor in math. Um, so uh, I, I came into the UW uh, like definitely wanting to get started in research as soon as possible, but obviously I didn't know much physics. Uh, luckily, there's a good class, um, I think it's 294, which uh, is basically a seminar where, where every week a professor comes in and they talk about their research. Um, so I was watching uh, the presentation by Professor Seidler, who works in X-ray spectroscopy, and he said that, uh, you know, he's looking for undergrads, and he even, like, put up, like, a template email, so if you wanted to email him. I then not be done exactly, but uh, it, it was a nice guy to laugh. But anyway, I reached out to him and started on a project with him. Um, uh, I mean, the, the first project was actually designing, you know, I, I learned some CAD and it was designing this uh, like vacuum sealed refrigerated sample holder for this, this special sample that the chemistry department wanted to analyze. Uh, but COVID kind of shut that down. So I actually started working on a, a project uh, with uh, Samantha Teta, who's a graduate student. Um, on analyzing the, the spectra of phosphororganic molecules using um, the, the X-ray spectra using machine learning to try to see what chemical information you can extract from the spectra. Um, and, and that was a really cool project. I, I worked on that, um, including through the summer of 2020, uh, 2021, as part of the, the Washington NASA space grant. Um, and then actually this last summer, uh, we actually published that paper on it. Um, then actually in, uh, at, in August of last year, uh, I, I, uh, through Professor Seidler, he introduced me to some scientists at Argonne National Lab. And uh, I began working um, part-time for Argonne National Lab. 
uh, during last school year for Dr. Chen Jun Sun there. Um, and there, my work was actually uh, kind of more on the instrumentation side. It was uh, writing this Python package for um, collecting the data from, from their, their, they have these detectors, right? And translating whatever the raw data is to the X-ray spectrum. Uh, and I worked on that all through, all through last year and actually got to go on site to the advanced photon source. It's a synchrotron that they have uh, in you know, kind of outside of Chicago where Hartman National Lab is. I got to go there uh, on site and work full time for, for a couple of weeks at the beginning of this summer. And then also since the spring, uh, I've uh, been doing research in a, a new lab uh, run by uh, Professor Moradian, who's actually an ECB. Um, it, but she's working on trapped ion quantum computing. So now my, my current work is uh, in uh, trying to uh, make a certain quantum computing gate that's used to entangle two qubits, trying to make that uh, more resistant to errors. And th that's been fun because uh, it, I actually get to do a lot more, more math um, uh, and, and as opposed to, to, say, more writing code. Um, and yeah, so so my hope is that after this quarter, I'm currently applying to graduate schools for next year for, for physics uh, to work in hopefully like quantum information theory. Um, but uh, we're also trying to set it up so that I can return in the spring uh, and continue my current research in Professor Moradian's lab. Uh, yeah, for the first half of next year. Awesome. Okay. Um, so we'd like to open it up to questions. So if people have questions, just raise your hand. If you have them for a specific panelist, you can ask it for a specific person. Yeah. Uh, when would you guys recommend trying to get your first research uh, project? At least sophomore year. Like during the summer is good. So end of sophomore year would be a good time where you've had enough classes under your belt. You kind of know what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. And you have enough free time to actually do meaningful, get meaningful progress on a project. But keep in mind, it can take a little bit to get a project. So if you want to start by then, you might start doing that like now. Definitely take like most of the 220x classes before you start looking. I would say actually that it's, uh, I mean, if you really want to get into research in your first year, you, you definitely can. Um, but if you, if you want to, you know, like be doing business calculations, right? Uh, yeah, you, you do kind of need to take a lot of classes before you get to that level. Um, but if you've got some marketable skills, like say you know CAD or, or you know computer programming. Um, if you reach out to professors, like chances are you'll find one who's, who's willing to uh, you know just take you on. And what you'll be doing isn't necessarily physics itself. You're mostly just doing engineering, but at least you get to do engineering for physics, and uh, you get to learn about the physics as you do it. So th th that's a really good way to start if you want to get started early. Like even if you don't know programming now. Uh, if you just you know study up on it a little bit and then you can email a professor like hey at least I, I know python can you put me to work in some way or another uh, you, that way you can get started um with research before you actually know much physics and you can also kind of brush close to research without having to be in a group because there's things like the directed reading programs which are really good um, resources to kind of get more in-depth stuff um and there's also uh thing I did my sophomore year uh, and a few other people did, I don't think it was last year, but uh, this thing called the International Physics Tournament. And they're kind of like release like a list of open-ended problems that you can kind of tackle by yourself, which are, you know, things like, you know, fairly like straightforward physical phenomena, but like you can kind of do your own individual research on it. And you can show that progress that you've made to that to professors when you're actually trying to get into research group. You're like, oh, this kid knows some stuff. Um, but it's also just really fun. So things like that are kind of finding research without having to get into a group. You can do it as early as you want. Um, also to add on to what Tree said about really waiting until you're pretty much through 200 levels, 
Um, not only do you have like a good base level knowledge maybe to start engaging with research, I would also say it's not until the year 200 that you start maybe understanding the workload that your classes are going to be, and you would really suck to overload yourself. So that's really key because it can be a lot of balance. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, just to, yeah, just to, just to add on, uh, you know, there's whatever research group you're going to get into. Uh, if you do wind up getting into it pretty early on, you know, maybe after your 220x series classes, um, there's going to be a lot of stuff that, like, especially for me, I didn't really understand, um, and I'll, basically everything went over my head, um, and that's really still pretty good for for your educational like experience. Uh, because just kind of being around all of that information, um, when it comes back up in your classes, it's it's not the first time you've experienced it, and it'll help you later on in your classes as well. Yeah. Um, so how much coding experience would you say is required to start research? Like, and, and for that too, like, because I have some basic experience, but maybe not like, a lot so how much would yeah oh well it's not like there's actually like a minimum bar right it, it, it depends on what research you do right there, there is a lot of research that, that uh you know it's experimental say right so you need to write a lot of code to manage you know some instrument or to analyze the data or something like that um uh, I'm just suggesting that because that that is, you know, like a sort of engineering skills or something that a lot of people have before they have, um, you know, real physics knowledge, right? You, like a lot of people might come with, with some engineering skills from high school, um, but obviously it'll be another couple of years before you really got a good enough grasp on physics. Um, so, so what I'm suggesting is that if you do have those skills, then it's really nice. Uh, it's kind of an easy way to get into research because you can be useful in a lab, even if you don't really know what's going on science-wise. Yeah, to add on to that, I would say one programming class for the equivalent is definitely enough. Yeah, I took a Math 301, um, and I've been doing research for you know over half a year now, and I just started having to code in my research, and I'm like, basically kind of learning from square one because it's slightly different than what I learned in my math real one. So it's not really necessary, but it's definitely nice to know some code. I would say it depends on the type of research you want to go to. Like with my research, I also did not have to code until very recently. And I probably could have expressed like, hey, I don't really want to learn how to code. And they probably never would have made me. So with um, astronomy, since it's a lot more kind of data science based, than a lot of physics labs. Uh, almost every research project there requires some kind of Python coding, um, which is why they, they uh, make everyone take Astro 300, which is the intro coding to Python course. Um, you could also substitute with AMAT 301. But yeah, it, it, you don't need an advanced level of coding because you, know, you could always just sift through documentation for project specific stuff. But just having at least one intro level course uh, is definitely worthwhile. Any questions from the uh, Zoom audience? When you did start research, how did you juggle? The extra workload your classes without its strategies. Um, so I definitely didn't uh, start doing that many hours at first when I first joined. I think something that was spooky scary for me, but maybe wouldn't be far away, is that I wasn't really sure once you got into the lab how you arranged when you come into the lab. <laughs> so I kind of just waited for the grad student that I work under to text me, which so I would just say that maybe when you talk with the PI, you could just be like, hey, this is my approximation of the hours I can put in, and you can just hold yourself to that. So I'd say maybe starting at first, definitely under 10, probably maybe like four hours a week would be a much more doable thing than your first time. 
Uh, I started in nuclear physics and I obviously had never taken a nuclear physics class before. So I think my first three months uh, were just like independently reading like textbooks and chapters about like radiation and semiconductors. So uh, for me, it was a lot more just like, when am I gonna have time to read this versus actually going into the lab? So I think it does depend on your research group. I started in the summer when I had a lot more free time to kind of put towards the project. And I thought I could do the same fall quarter, um, which I definitely couldn't. So it was a lot of trial and error for me. Um, but, uh, you know, you don't, you shouldn't be afraid to ask your professor, like, hey, can I scale back the amount of hours I'm working on this project? I just get too busy, you know? So, yeah, trial and error. Yeah, I'd say if, you, if you're not in, like, a a program that has like specifically time slots for like an experimental project you kind of just have to schedule it into your own day as like there's basically homework um especially if it's like an individual project with a professor um they kind of leave the pacing completely up to you and so you really have to um just like even sometimes force yourself to get work done by saying hey can i meet with you on this coming monday and then that's kind of a deadline for you to have something done by um so when you talk to them about it yeah, I, it's really important to like keep setting up meetings with whoever you're working with because that will force you to get stuff done. But also, if it's like you know, midterm week, also have you know, grad school apps or whatever, you can definitely take a week off, and most professors are not unhappy with that. So I have a question. Um, did any of you face like difficulties when you were starting out or like uncertainties or I don't know, imposters just because of the sheer like overload of information that your mentors would throw at you? Okay. And how did you deal with that? I can definitely speak to that. <laughs> so um, I, you know, have not always been my friendly self. So I used to be very afraid of not only professors, but also grad students, which is really funny thinking about it now. So when I first joined, I was like way too uncomfortable to ever ask any questions that I didn't like my grad student mentor or anyone else in the lab. And then I just felt like they would talk and I wouldn't understand. And I was like, wow, I'm too dumb to be in this lab, wow, and like everything's going wrong. And at a certain point, it was just kind of like, oh, this is just some guy. He's not going to judge me two years ago. So kind of just accepting like, hey, they know that they accepted an undergrad at your level. They're not expecting you to be Albert Einstein. So asking questions and just being clear with where you're at and just show your time and like everyone's going to be very happy you're there. So. I'd say just like give yourself some leeway and also be honest when you're confused and don't be afraid of grad students. They're literally just like people a little bit older. <laughs> it's very normal to have like no idea what's happening for at least a month, if not longer. Like for um, my, my math department research, like I was in that program for a whole quarter and had gotten nothing done because I just did not know what was happening. And it was normal because it takes a long time to get to like prerequisite knowledge that you're talking about, it's like actually do research because it's not stuff that's covered in class at all. Like uh, Olivia said, I was terrified to ask questions and we would have group meetings at 8.30 in the morning because part of the lab was in Germany and I would never ask a single question even though I was confused the whole time until eventually my PI decided that everyone had to ask a question. And so we reached the end and of course I hadn't asked a question that she made me ask a question. And I asked a question and she was like, that's a great question, but you should have asked it on the first slide. <laughs> that, was, that was so embarrassing that I decided I was gonna ask questions when they came up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same experience here. Um, my first lab, I, it was a lot of nanophotonics, which I still don't really understand a year later. Um, so it's, I don't know, even the literature that they give you to help you understand the project, you still just have to persistently ask questions if you're unsure about something.
Yeah, and I think for the first uh, whole quarter, I, I was completely lost as to what was kind of going on in our lab. Um, I knew like on the day to day stuff what was happening. Um, but in terms of like the physics behind what we were doing and why we were doing it, I had no idea. Um, so it's it's yeah completely normal uh, to definitely feel like you don't belong. Um, and on some days I still feel like I'm kind of the dumbest guy in the room, um, but I'm also like an undergrad. So there's a lot of stuff that I haven't um, experienced yet, especially compared to like the graduate students. Um, and it's just something that I think more exposure to you, you wind up just kind of accepting that like these people that you're working with are going to know a lot more than you and that's totally fine just kind of sit there and kind of learn from them and you'll be you'll be all right there's a lot of freedom in being the dumbest person in the room you can ask <laughs> anything totally. yeah <laughs> you, yeah so don't take advantage of that opportunity while you have it you'll want to feel more embarrassed about looking dumb as you get older yeah just speak to that Something my bad mentor says that makes me feel better about literally everything all the time is if anything bad happens or goes wrong, it's not your fault because you're an undergrad. You can't be blamed for it. <laughs> it's always his fault. It's too nice for me. I had like a, I have a partner. Uh, there's like several undergrads who work in our lab, and we all kind of work together. And it's very nice for me to all like be sitting in on a, especially over the summer, we'd have meetings and we'd be listening to like our research advisor talked during the meeting and then we'd all leave and just look at each other and say does anyone know what's happening right now and we'd like all be like confused but about different things so then you know we get to talk and we're all clueless so we feel better about ourselves and then you know you ask grad students for help it's been great we have a question yeah well, then you want to read it then? Yeah. Thank you. So the question is, what does theoretical research look like on a day-to-day -day level as compared to empirical research? I mean, I don't know as in compared to, but I can talk about what I did just a couple days ago. Um, I had my friend David come over to my apartment and then we sat in front of a whiteboard and tried to compute a specific thing that our uh, advisor had given us to compute for a simplified version of it. And so we just kind of like kind of chugged through that and some surprising things. But generally, like either you have, I think it's probably the same, you either have a very specific task to like show this, do this, commute this limit and interval, do, do something specific, or it's like kind of exploratory and like you don't really, the, the advisor and you don't know what's happening. So you kind of have to just think about things and try some stuff out and see which uh, strings are valuable to tug on and which are completely horrendous and, and lead to nothing. But so it's just like, I think it's pretty similar. You just kind of take some time with your either group mates or by yourself and, and just work on something specific or adventurous. I guess I don't do just theoretical. I do a lot of computational stuff, but the times that I've done or seen other people do theoretical research, it's a lot of, you know, meaning with the professor or the grad student, and then staring at the chalkboard, wondering what's happening as they somehow have epiphanies and you really don't, but <laughs> that's what theoretical research is like. A big part of it too is like getting very confused and then going to your advisor who's been doing this really decades longer than you have, maybe as long as you've been alive. And then them going, oh, you can do this. And then it being very helpful and going and trying to do that, getting very confused and coming back. And then that cycle just repeat. Um, I'm definitely the least theoretical person here, but um, I would like to know all my friends that want to do theory definitely got into it a bit later because it's kind of a higher like, barrier to it because you need to have like enough background to actually engage with it. So you might want to start later than what we previously recommended is all. Yeah, a good path is, well, at least the path I followed was I started with very computational and then I did nearly all computational and now I'm doing mostly computational with a bit of theory. So like starting computational is a good way. Vikram, you've done both, right? Yeah, uh, I guess I started out, I guess, sort of more on the computational side. I don't have actual experimental experience. I've never actually done an experiment, I've been in a lab uh, where they were doing lab things. 
Um, uh, I mean, the lab has been doing lab things. I just wasn't doing the lab things. Um, but yeah, I guess one, one of your, your say working on something more computational, like experimental, uh, the problems you face day to day are much smaller, right? Uh, you, you're trying to get this specific machine to work. You're trying to learn this uh, specific, you know, you're reading the documentation for something and just trying to get it to work. Um, versus, uh, you know, what I'm doing now is very much, you know, actually just doing calculations. So uh, that, for the most part, just requires me to spend a lot of my time trying to read more on quantum mechanics than I actually learned in the series. Uh, so I, I'd say that's, that's an important part is, uh, you know, just to be able to do the calculation that I want to do, I, I need to go back and, and just read a bunch of stuff. So it's a lot of studying for me. Um, but then, you know, the actual calculation itself that I've been trying to do for like a few weeks now is, is very simple, or it will be once I actually understand how to do it. Once you actually, especially when it's coming from a paper, everything is explained so abstractly and poorly, and you're like, finally understand it, it's so much simpler than it should have should have been. Um, yeah. all, all the papers are written so that the, you know, like 10 other people who actually work in that subfield will be able to read it, not necessarily for the general public. Uh, one useful thing is going and reading like PhD theses because they actually explain stuff a lot more. But I'd say as far as also like a difference in overall, like how do you decide what calculation to do? Like that, that sounds very abstract. Um, but I guess the, the theory is it, it is more, it, it is similar in the sense that like just like an experiment, you're testing out stuff, you notice something interesting and you're investigated for it. it. It's actually the same thing if you're working on something more theoretical. You just, um, yeah, guess like, you know, I, it seems, you know, when I ran the simulation on this property, you know, maybe I can actually go into the map and prove that. And if I can prove that and then make a few more assumptions, then maybe I could do this. So then you go and you actually check if all of that is true. It is a lot of hunches, I guess. Yeah, my, uh, our day to day in the nanophysics lab varies. Um, wildly uh if if we have fridge time which is downstairs in the big cryostat um then our grad students are obviously going to be working down there um, but otherwise it's a lot of like engineering tasks it's a lot of prep work um you know we have to build uh stamps or um you know exfoliate material so like every day um it's going to look quite a bit different um from the from the next or from the last and so um it's just a matter of kind of preparing everything uh kind of weeks in advance for for you know one day of experimentation other questions i have a question so how many hours a week do you typically work in your research Applications, I say eight to ten in each project. But that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 for, for my math project, I probably would say five. Um, maybe maybe some weeks are higher. That's definitely it, it ranges. Some weeks it's way higher. Some weeks it's way lower. And then with the individual research with with Anton, um, that kind of is like probably maybe three or four, I'd say, realistically. Yeah, uh, for me, it definitely fluctuates um, because like there are set times between when they're taking data from my research. So like I can't, if I get all my work done before, like weeks before they're taking data, then you know, you're not really doing anything. And like if your PI is too busy to like be like, okay, well, here's something else you can do while you're waiting, then you kind of just stuck around. But otherwise I would say like uh, five to six hours a week. I only say seven. Um, usually it's five, and then some weeks it's a lot more than five. <laughs> so I average to seven. Yeah, I think prematurity is just, it definitely varies um, week to week, and completely discounting this quarter because of grad school applications. I would say that I have historically spent probably around like eight hours in a week, and then during the summer, I spent 
one week I literally spent over 40 hours. So it, that was that was crazy, but it, it depends. Yeah, um, I'd say on average during the school year, mine was six. Um, I don't think realistically during, when you have classes, you could go above 10. Um, you just would have too much work. So. I, I also always read 10 on any official thing. Um, realistically, it is it is more like five, except for uh, then um, the day before you actually meet with the professor, you make up the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, yeah, do you have your... Yeah, I'd say I average probably about nine uh, a week, but um, in the beginning of the school week, uh, quarter, it's uh, much, much, much higher. And then as it gets towards the late, you know, last week of the quarter, it's like three. I just want to ask a follow up, like how much of that variation is like of your choosing and how much of that is like, well, I have all this crap I need to do this week, right? I, I would say it's probably not like voluntary. It's mostly just we all have projects, exams, homework that we need to do. And thankfully, it seems like we all have professors who are kind of flexible enough. We're like, yeah, you could, you know, make up the time some other week. It's a little bit harder to put the hours in when you're banging your head against the wall. It's like when you start making progress and you're like, oh, it's amazing. You spent like hours, don't even realize it. But like if it's just going nowhere, it's really hard to still put that time in. And sometimes not even productive to still put that time in. I usually think of applications to anywhere as in the same category as research. So like right now, this week, I filled out four grad school applications, but I didn't do any research. But to me, that kind of balances it out. So I really feel like applications and research trade-offs. The more applications you're doing, the less research and vice versa. I think generally you'll find that students like doing their research more than their classwork. So if they can get away with doing more research, they will. And like if you know you're slammed with school, then don't do as much research, but it's never really your own choice. <laughs> I don't know if they're doing their own time limits, but kind of what Trudy just said to you. I famously complain when I don't get to go to class, but sometimes they just like, my grad student has grown the samples, they've been analyzed, he's just like doing coding, and I'm like, let me come in, and he's like, no, what is there for you to do? Isn't that always sucks? <laughs> Also, kind of along those lines, have any of you gotten paid or gotten credit for research? I've gotten credit. <laughs> <laughs> like, of course, credit. the other one. <laughs> <laughs> like, of course, credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've also gotten credit for a few quarters, which is a super easy process. Um, but I've not gotten paid. However, um, some people over the summer in my kind of thing did get paid. There was like an are you at UW and like a materials kind of thing. And so you could apply for that as a UW student and they're like, cool, here's some money. We're so proud of you. And they also had applications for continuing that. Notably, I did not apply to these things and I'm bitter about it, but you can technically <laughs> get paid. <laughs> I have gotten paid twice. Yeah. I guess I've gotten two awards. The first I got um, Mary Gates Research Scholarship all of you should try to apply for. There's, they give out money each year. And then I did an RU this summer at the Santa Fe Institute where I also got paid. Do you wanna say what RU is? Um, research experience for undergrads. It's a test. <laughs> a lot of people might not know what it is. Yeah. Uh, definitely apply for those. You probably won't get in until you're a junior or, but, all. or at all. <laughs> I, I didn't get in <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I got into this one, and then I got into none of the other ones I applied for. I they just really liked the beginning of my essay. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think in general, you go to a different university and do research there upon a specific project, and they have them in math, statistics, and a bunch of other uh, subjects. But uh, they're like acceptance rates are like. Ordering five percent for most of them. Yeah, lower than grad school. Mine was we got 
10, there were nine of us out of over 200. You know, I, I'm gonna be honest, I've never met someone that's done this, but I think hypothetically, if you're joining a lab and you have experience and you're qualified in what you're doing, I think it is fair in your meeting with the PI to ask if you could complete it, because they have fun. I don't know anyone that's done this, but I feel like hypothetically, you can bring this up and they probably won't spit in your face. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they will flat out tell you that you're not gonna get paid. But a no is better than but like, I will never know. You're more likely to pay you maybe after you've been there for a while, so you're actually gone past the basics and you can actually do useful work. They're not gonna pay you just to have you spend like another three months reading background material. Um, I got paid uh, through, through the Washington NASA Space Grant, which I, I don't know if that's like every year or something, but you should definitely apply for it because I wasn't doing anything particularly space related and I still got it. Um, but they, they paid uh, students $5,000 for the summer. And I did that in summer of 2021. And then when I was working for Argonne National Lab, right, all through the school year, I was working uh, 10 hours a week, part time, and it was remotely, right? I was just here doing my schoolwork, but also, you know, did some work and, and they actually paid me like 20 bucks an hour, 10 hours a week. Um, and then full time, actually, while I was there on site. So that, that was pretty sweet. And it was very much like I was just doing it on my own. I didn't actually need to, like I plugged in hours at the end of the week, but it was very much free as for, you know, when I did my work, um, it was just like two meetings a week. What was the space grant application process? Was it particularly selective? Uh, I think you, you wrote, um, you wrote something about the research you were planning to do or I, I think there was two options, right? If you had a specific you know, professor and project you were working on, you could talk about that. But you could also just apply without having a project yet and then match you up with professors, I think. Um, I, I don't know about that as much because I did, did have a project that I was currently working on. Um, but yeah, we, we just had to write about the project and Professor Seidler said to you know mention one or two things about how it could possibly relate to space and astronomy. <laughs> Apparently that worked. <laughs> um, so, yeah. If you're interested in applying, um, I don't know what the like structure of like who manages that grant, but here um, Sarah Tuttle actually does play like a big role in the applications for it. So it might be worth emailing her to ask her more about it. Well, I think we should call, bring this part to a close. Um, this has been great. Um, I want to thank the panelists again for coming and spending the time. So um, now we'll move into the next phase. There are a few grad students who have shown up and if they can just stand up and introduce themselves very briefly. Uh, <laughs> I'll go first because you all know me already. So I'm Jordan. I'm in my fourth year. I work with Charles, who does space like materials in a lot of different ways.